All right, Lords of the Fallen, let's talk about it. This is going to be my review. This title was sent to me by CI Games so that I could give it a look, tell you guys my opinions on it. In case I look or sound sleepy, it is because I was up until one in the morning last night playing my third character in multiplayer with my friend Wada. By the way, that character is the one that you are watching in the background in case it looks like my character is completely bonkers, busted, destroying everything. It is because, you know, you're not really supposed to be as powerful as that character is at that point in the game. But basically, I wanted to speed boost one of my characters along because I've been looking to see which build I like the most when it comes to Lords of the Fallen. And for that, you guys might know if you've watched my live stream, you'll know that in that uh, live stream, it was kind of like a hybrid radiance slash strength build, which is the equivalent of Dark Souls, you know, strength faith build. So I did that hybrid. I really liked it. It's really powerful, but I wanted to do something a little bit different. As I was playing that particular character in the live stream, I've also been playing the game in multiplayer with a friend on PlayStation 5, and in that playthrough, I've been doing an Infernal character, which is mostly kind of like a pyromancer using all of the fire spells. And I got some criticism about the way that they've done, uh, not necessarily the way that they've done pyromancy itself, but the way in which the items are distributed along the game, because there's, there's quite a couple of things to tackle when it comes to this game. But anyway, once I finished that character, I was like, okay, I think what I really want is a pure Radiance build. So I got together with my friend, and basically I upgraded a bunch of items, gave it to him, and then he gave it to me on my new character. And that is why that character at that point of the game is a little bit busted. That's why he's dealing so much damage and destroying everything. But the gameplay footage is just to show you guys what the game looks like, what the animations look like, you know, and get an overall feel for the gameplay. Do not judge the difficulty there, even though once you're like past the 60% mark of the game, assuming that your build comes online... It kind of looks like that, too. You're basically shredding through everything. Again, depending on your build and how good it is and all of that stuff. But anyway, let's get things started. What is Lords of the Fallen all about? You might be wondering. Now, naturally, Lords of the Fallen is one of the most recent Souls-likes that has come out. One of the defining characteristics of this particular Souls-like, I would say, is the fact that it takes place in two worlds, so to speak. You have the world of Axiom and the world of Umbral, and it has this very specific mechanic where whenever you die in Axiom, you get sent to Umbral. You can also go to Umbral manually, but the idea is that you almost, you have two lives, almost, assuming that you're in Axiom, which is the domain, the world of living and all that stuff. When you die, you get sent to Umbral, and then in Umbral, there's going to be non-stop spawning enemies, and you're kind of on the clock. It's almost like a GTA wanted level situation. Whenever you're down there, your wanted level just keeps growing, and at some point, they send in the big red cop to come and get you, and he's gonna go ahead and brutally try to murder you. He's, gonna, he's usually overleveled, so the whole point is like, once you're in Umbral, you're kind of like on the clock, enemies are constantly spawning, constantly attack you you know, consistently stronger enemies trying to come after you in order to get you to, to die. So you have to, like, leave Umbral with a certain level of expeditiousness. However, uh, Umbral is also used to solve certain puzzle, puzzle sections in the game. There are going to be items and treasures that are hidden in Umbral that are going to require you to actually jump into Umbral in order to be able to acquire specific treasures and, and even, like, specific items and upgrade materials and all of this stuff. And, uh, you know, there's reasons for you to go there, both part of your main path as well as part of just, like, exploration and all that stuff. Basically, that is one of my favorite features in the game, okay? But yeah, it is a Souls-like. Uh, I've, I've seen a lot of people, usually they like to bring up, because considering that these two games came, uh, you know, they came out reasonably close together, Lies of P and Lords of the Fallen, which, by the way, I also received the code for Lies of P. I've done a bunch of videos on Lies of P. Me and Lies of P, it's kind of like a love-hate relationship. I love to hate it, and I hate to love it. It's, <laughs> it's a weird situation, but you guys might have seen that particular saga, but I, I would say that my overall experience with Lies of P was also really positive. So, anyways, let's get to it, because this is one of the most asked questions that I get. Rurikon, should I get Lies of P, or should I get Lords of the Fallen? I can only afford one. In my opinion, it's like, if you can afford both, I think you'll enjoy both. But stick around because we do have a couple of caveats that we have to go through, especially when it comes to Lords of the Fallen. But I feel like one of the most simplified ways of explaining this, and if you've been through my live streams, I'm going to have to go ahead and apologize because I'm going to be repeating myself a little bit. One of the most simplified ways of putting the question down is, do you like Sekiro and Bloodborne more? Or... Do you like 
Dark Souls and Demon Souls more? Because I feel like that is one of the main decision makers when it comes to which one of these two games you're going to enjoy more. And in my opinion, if you're more of a Bloodborne kind of guy, Sekiro kind of guy, you know, kind of that style of gameplay, so the parries and uh, the more fast-paced action gameplay and all of that super tight combat, I think that you're going to want to get Lies of P. I think Lies of P is the, the better game for people that prefer Bloodborne and Sekiro. People that prefer Dark Souls and Demon Souls and that kind of game, you're going to want to get uh, Lords of the Fallen. And actually, there's a couple of caveats here too, which is in terms of, for instance, Lies of P does not have multiplayer, Lords of the Fallen have multiplayer. So if you want something that also supports multiplayer, you'll want to get Lords of the Fallen. Now, the multiplayer in Lords of the Fallen is actually an evolution, but I'm not going to get into that in this video. If you want, I have a video where I detail literally everything there is to know about Lords of the Fallen multiplayer, with the exception of PvP, but to be honest, PvP in the game is kind of busted. <laughs> it's like, listen, <laughs> PvP in this game is really weird, and basically, it right now, it seems that the meta is around just having like a certain Radiant spell that will just destroy everything. Like, this is a Radiant spell that you cast, you don't even have to have a target. It'll just automatically hone in on your target and kill it in one shot. So, I wouldn't really worry too much about PvP. Personally, I don't really tend to do PvP too much in these games. And if you're concerned about PvP, I don't think that you're going to enjoy that part all too much. But anyways, that is kind of like what Lords of the Fallen is. However, the one big caveat that I have to bring to the table before we move any further is that Lords of the Fallen is unfortunately plagued with technical and performance issues. Now, I do have to give some props to the team. They've been addressing a lot of these issues. I've actually been in contact with them and reporting a lot of the problems that I've been having. But that doesn't change the fact that if you've been watching my live stream, you've seen that probably throughout my whole playthrough, I might have crashed the game like 30 times. Hell, just yesterday I was in Cowboy's live stream. By the way, I know that I have a somewhat of a different setup. People always ask me, Rurikon, what's your setup? It is a Ryzen 9 5900X with a 6900 XT AMD card. And usually when you have situations like this, you know, teams tend to optimize more for NVIDIA instead of optimizing for AMD, and AMD ends up with problems. Yesterday I was in Cowboy's stream. He has an NVIDIA, and the game crashed on him as well, like right there on stream. And it was like, I, I was in his stream for like 10 minutes, okay? So it's like, there's definitely a lot of technical and performance issues when it comes to this game. Uh, it seems to be even worse if you have an AMD card like me. I know that the team is working on it. I hope that they can fix it. But basically, at this point in time, it is definitely something that I need to bring up. And if you like this in a review, to talk about performance, which is a problem. Now, one of the reasons, I think, is the team is really squeezing out all of the juice that they can uh, of Unreal Engine, which I want to talk a little bit more about when we get into the visual section of the game. But they might have uh, reached a little bit too close to the sun, and that's why GPUs all over the world are crashing this game left, right, and center. Now, I've heard from a lot of people, oh, I play on PS5. My experience is flawless. I crashed the game like three times last night on PS5. Now you're going to tell me, oh, not only your GPU is broken, your PS5 is broken too. Where, you know, I mean, is, is that where we're getting like all of my hardware is broken? I buy a new computer, crash it there too. It's that computer's problem. Come on now, people. Clearly there's, there's some problems with the game. I hope that the team gets it under control. But right now it is something that people need to be aware of. Now there's also performance issues, like I said, because I do feel they're squeezing every little thing they can out of a real... Unreal Engine 5, and to a certain extent, I even think that that comes at a disadvantage, but we'll get into that a little bit more. Now, overall, I greatly enjoyed my time with the game. I think that that's a no-brainer if I was playing it up until like 1 a.m. last night, and I'm excited later uh, today to, to go ahead and play the game with my friends some more because we've been doing multiplayer, and it's just been a ton of fun. We're trying to like figure out all these different quest lines. At, at this point, both of us have finished the game. I've done the Radiant ending and the Umbral ending, and my friend, I think, also did the Radiant ending, so the next thing that I'm going to be working on is probably the Infernal ending. Uh, so, you know, I, I've been working on all different endings, and that is not something that I would be doing unless I really enjoy the game. I don't think I'm going to be chasing this one for the Platinum because they want too much. <laughs> Collect every single armor piece. Bro, I don't even know how to track that properly, okay? There's too much okay collect every single weapon i'm not interested collect every single spell uh-uh i'm not doing that but overall my enjoyment of the game has definitely been uh a ton of fun and it is something that i want to try i'm even going to try to do new game plus which 
there is no vestiges, which is kind of like, oh, play Dark Souls, but without bonfires. I'm not exactly sure how I feel about that, but uh, we'll, we'll see. Eventually, I'll get to that particular challenge as well. But suffice it to say, I like the game a lot, but it does have a lot of technical and performance issues. So now let's get into specifics. I'm going to be starting things off as per usual with visuals and sound. Now, in terms of visuals, I think the game looks really good. I think they've done a fantastic job in the way that, you know, the overall... Uh, game looks. I think that the art style is nice. It's not my favorite type of art style for a game like this, but uh, you know, they're going for that gothic stuff. I think the umbral looks really cool, and I think that the axiom looks really cool, but I think that some things uh, could be, I don't know, I just feel like there's some improvement that could be made, particularly because, and this is something that I brought up, there's even like a short video talking about it. I feel like there's maybe too much visual clutter on screen with the sheer amount of detail that they've been able to do. And it's interesting because initially I thought that this was just a me thing. So, you know, I made that meme of me and Cowboys like, it's too much detail. And back in my day, they used to have like a red aura. And now they're just blending in. You, know, you guys know the video that I'm talking about. We did that little short. It was, it's funny and all of that stuff. But I've realized once I did that, I've actually received quite a few comments of people saying, no, actually I feel the same way. And recently Ratatosker put out a video also expressing that like sometimes he can't make out some of the details as well because there's just too much stuff on screen. And this, this is where I feel like the team kind of like going too hard on Unreal Engine 5 is actually comes with a little bit of a disadvantage because the game has so much detail. It, it almost feels like the team got to a point where they were, you know, finding out new bells and whistles on Unreal Engine 5. And they're like, oh, look at this new type of particle effect I found. Oh, look at this one. Look at that. And every time they found one, they just put it in the game. More particle effects, more particle effects, more particle effects. And it's too much. You know, you can have too much of a good thing. Like, you know, there. I feel like there are too many particle effects on this game. There's particle effects on your lantern. There's particle effects on your character's eyes when you go into Umbral. There's particle effects on every single enemy that spawns to attack you in Umbral. And let me tell you, there's tons of them. There's particle effects on, like, the, the burning enemies that show up. You'll probably see a ton of those in here as well. There's particle effects on the fire that is around you. There's, there's too, I think that there's too much. And the interesting thing is, because of the crashes that I've been having on PC and all of that stuff, in a lot of situations, I actually reduced the, the visuals. So I would go from, like, ultra to high to medium. And I noticed that, like, you know what? I like the game better on lower settings. <laughs> Because there's less clutter on screen. I know it sounds weird, but it feels that way. I feel like somebody should have should have gone in when the team was like going balls to the walls with all these particle effects. Somebody should have gone in there and like ran them and it's like, hey, listen, buddy, okay? This might be too much, all right? But that's my feeling. I'm actually curious to hear more from you guys. Like if you've seen footage, if you've played the game, do you feel the same way? Do you not feel the same way? I think that this is actually one of the interesting topics of discussion to have because, you know, we're going to see more and more games as they take more advantage of Unreal Engine 5 do this type of stuff. And I'm curious to hear what people's take is, is on that. Anyway, we already talked about the technical performance issues. I don't want to uh, harp on too much more on that. But overall, visually speaking, I like the way that the weapons look. Uh, as a matter of fact, that's a big thing that I got to bring up. Very few Souls games, I don't know why, but very few Souls games have cool looking hammers. I don't understand why this is, but there, like, there's some limitation to people. They're like, oh yeah, we can do axes, we can do swords, we can do spears, but when it comes to hammers, we'll give you war picks, okay? That's what you, you get a war pick. And you're like, bro, I want a hammer. A proper, thick hammer. Like, listen, guys remember Bloodborne? The Kirk hammer? That's what I'm talking about. A big slab of rock on top of a stick. Okay? And this game has them in spades. Okay? We got tons of really cool looking hammers, which is something that I don't get a lot of. Th that probably contributes a lot to my enjoyment of the game. Okay? Having a good proper hammer, like one-handed hammers, two-handed hammers, that look cool and badass. Like the, the, the weapon that I'm using in this character is not the most powerful weapon I can be using. Okay? Let me just put that out there. That's not the most powerful weapon you can be using, but it is one of the coolest looking weapons in the goddamn game. 
So anyways, uh, there's that. I love the, the visual variety there. Anyways, and, yeah, and armors also look really good uh, across the board as far as I'm controlled. Spells look fantastic, even though they could use a, maybe a little bit of toning down in some particle effects. Uh, Umbral looks like you're splooging everywhere. Um, you know, my friend plays Umbral, and that's, that's a little bit disgusting as he just like, <laughs> you just start hearing <laughs> like white stuff all over the screen. It's kind of weird, kind of weird. But anyways, uh, when it comes to sound, I've heard some criticisms on the sound. Now, the thing is, I don't really play swords. I haven't really played that many swords, so I don't know uh, too much about sword sounds. I've, I've heard them. It doesn't really uh, bother me too much. I will have to say that, like, the sound that I heard the most, which was hammer bonk on my main character on, on the live streams, that sound is just so brutally satisfying. You hear the metal caving somebody's skull and goes like, and then it hits the ground and goes like, bonk. It goes like, bonk. And it's beautiful because they've actually implemented this move set into this hammer that, you know, when you're two-handing it, your first swing goes down, then your next swing goes up, and then it hits behind you. So, like, it hits going up to the person in front of you, and then it hits as it falls behind. I love that. It's, oh, my God. It's such a, a, a tiny little detail, but it's so cool. So, in sounds, I don't have a whole lot of complaints. I think the game sounds good. Uh, I've heard a lot of people complaining about it. I don't know. Maybe I'm just... I just don't care that much. It doesn't bother me as much as other people. I thought the sounds were pretty good. Um, maybe not all weapons sound that fantastic. I, I, don't, I don't remember if the spear sounded great. Then again, spears kind of sucked all around, so whatever. Uh, soundtrack, I don't really remember much of it, to be honest. So, you know, it's fine. It's okay. It's not a big deal. Now, I want to touch up a little bit about story. We're not going to be going into the spoiler territory. There's not really a whole lot to say. The story is fairly simple. You should be able to pick up on it. Uh, without too many problems. Uh, there are some hidden things. Usually the hidden things are more about characters themselves than necessarily the plot in the world, unless you're going for the umbral ending, because in the umbral ending, there's a, a little bit more nuance and whatnot about some of the stuff that is happening in the world and whatnot. But overall, you should be able to understand the story just fine. Hey, old God, he's coming back. Things are going to be bad. We need to kill him. How are we going to do that? Well, there's a couple of different ways, and depending on the ways that you handle that situation... You're going to have different outcomes. But overall, this is kind of like the overall plot. I'm not going to, you know, this is pretty much explained to you the first five minutes of the game. Uh, but I'm not going to get too in-depth in that because I don't want to get to, you know, do spoilers or anything like that. Uh, however, I do have a huge criticism when it comes to story. And this is something that really bothered me. And if you were in the live stream, you'll have seen it. Now, it is important to say... I enjoy, I enjoy my experience in the game. I'm going through it like third time at this point. Probably going to go do New Game Plus, do all of this stuff because I really enjoy the gameplay, which we'll talk more about. But, but, number one complaint when it comes to the stores. So there's these things that are out in the world, which is, uh, is this, this is actually a really cool aspect, which is in Umbral, you'll have like these remnants of things that are kind of memories of events that happen. Now, depending on your first playthrough, you might not understand all of these events because you might be going through the game in a random order. The game is super, uh, the game is like super interconnected, kind of like Dark Souls 1, and it allows you to do things completely out of order if you want to, which is cool. I love that. I think that's fantastic, right? You can go into a really high level area, not even realize it, get completely lost there, get completely torn to bits, and then you're like, you have to figure out, oh, I should maybe go somewhere else. I like that because it keeps the game open and it lets you on future playthroughs just decide, oh, I know that there's this really cool weapon on this high level place, so I'm going to rush through everything and go get that weapon because I want that weapon for my character. Big ups on that. I think that is a really cool aspect. But uh, as I was saying, so there are these remnants that you will encounter as you are going through the game. These remnants are in Umbral. These are memories of things that, to, that happened in the game. And these will give you like story exposition. So, one of the biggest complaints that I have is, in order to access these, you have to go into Umbral. That's fine. No problem. You go into the Umbral, and then you pull it out, and you, you start listening to the story. The problem with doing this is that when you go into Rumble, and, and Rumble, when you go into Umbral, you're going to start to get overwhelmed with mobs. So, you have to focus on killing mobs that are going to be spawning. Whereas whenever you find these memories, these they're called uh, umbral stigmas. Whenever you find these umbral stigmas, 
you know, you want to be paying attention to what these characters are saying. You want to be paying attention to the dialogue. You want to be paying attention to the sounds because some of it is even told through sounds. Like you'll hear somebody stab somebody with a knife or something. And these these are not played out like cutscenes, right? This is, these are static things. Like if you remember the way that they did this in The Division, there were like those things where you could kind of like rebuild a scene using drones or whatever the crap it was. You could see like these holograms of an event that took place, but everything is static. You just hear the sound. You kind of like see a kind of like a painting of what happened there. Now, I, I really appreciate the Umbral Stigmas, but what, mo what bothered me is that with a lot of these Umbral Stigmas, I can't really appreciate them properly because you're just overwhelming me with monsters while I'm trying to pay attention to what is happening in this story moment. And it gets progressively worse as you, you know, as you advance further in the game because you start spawning even harder enemies. Like, there was this one umbral stigma that I wanted to get and this was very very late into the game and so I look around the room everything looks empty no problems I go into umbral everything is empty no problems I get to the stigma I trigger it and suddenly come flooding in a bunch of monsters and I'm like I'm trying to pay attention to this story moment and you're flooding me with monsters this makes no sense so I don't know what the solution is for that maybe they need to I don't know implement a shield around the umbral stigmas maybe say oh this memory is so important that not even the the minions of umbral dare to come close while you're listening to this memory I don't know come up with a reasonable solution or even better allow me to replay these stigmas and just show a render with a black backdrop in the background in some other area of the game. So like, oh, you unlock this stigma and then I can hear it later. Like, let me go back to Axiom and hear it in my own time when I'm not getting mobbed by monsters so that I can appreciate the story more. I think that this is a big problem for people trying to appreciate the story. And not only that, but like when it comes to uh, particularly one of the final bosses, I'm not going to tell you guys which one because there's different ones or not. One of the final bosses, he just has this huge monologue which I'm assuming is story exposition, but at the same time, you're supposed to be doing the boss fight. Like, I'm not kidding. I'm talking about this boss will speak for 10 minutes straight. He'll just be in there. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, my cursed child. Blah, 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 blah. I don't remember a damn thing he was saying because I was focusing on the boss fight. I was like, oh, I got to do this thing. I got to do that thing. I couldn't hear what the boss was saying. I'm like, dude, I'm, I'm, I'm working out. Although... Arguably, it was a pretty simple boss fight, sure, whatever, but I'm still like, I'm getting overwhelmed by mobs, there's fire coming from over there, fire coming from over there, and there's this guy just giving me this massive monologue, I'm not going to be able to pay attention to it, like, maybe I need to be a big zoomer or something, like, maybe I'm just too old, I can't multitask as efficiently, but I, you know, I feel like I would have liked to hear that dialogue in a different setting, like, maybe give me an optional cutscene after I killed a boss or something where you can tell me all of these things I, I don't know but it, it was just weird and then finally since I was talking about a final boss again not getting into spoilers or anything like that but let me tell you guys the ending of this game is super rushed okay it was definitely rushed you can tell me it wasn't when the ending of the game is basically like a very short cinematic and after that short cinematic fate the black white letters on a black screen telling you what happened. I was, I was just like, when I, when I finished the game for the first time, I'm looking at my screen, I'm going like, that's it? <laughs> it's like, what happened? This is how you're telling me what happened at the end. It was weird. I, I, that's all I'm saying. I, I felt like it was really weird because the rest of the game, there's all of these things happening. There's cutscenes here, cutscenes there. There's all of this exposition dialogue and then you get to the ending and it's like fate to black white letters on a black background i was like bro what happened there Did you guys run out of budget <laughs> i don't know it might have been what happened but you know like i said this is, these are not things that are going to prevent me from enjoying the game but it is definitely something that for a lot of people they're not going to like it and they're going to be really disappointed when they get to the end and see that but anyways those are my comments when it comes to the story and a little bit of feedback about some of the things that I have seen. Now, like I said, the story isn't really a massive driving for me, a massive uh, driving um, effect for me. The main thing is the gameplay, and the gameplay, I feel, is where the game really shines. So like I said at the beginning of this review, uh, 
Uh, this is a Souls-like with two worlds, and this is one of the things where I feel like these two worlds are really well interconnected, really well integrated. And I've heard a lot of people criticize the level design of the game, which is weird to me because I feel completely different than what I've heard from people. People have been saying, I believe that there was even like a reviewer, uh, I forget what one of the mainstream websites, whatever, just said, oh, the level design is terrible. And that to me just kind of screams, you know, the usual thing where, oh, there's a, an editor in chief or something brooding down a reviewer's neck, just going like, finish the review, John, you gotta finish it. And the dude's getting lost in the level because these levels are super intricate and sometimes even confusing by design and dude's getting lost in levels like oh, this level design sucks i can't finish this goddamn game that kind of feels like what happened to some people i don't know if that's the case or not because like i said overall i feel like the levels are really fun i feel like the way that umbral is integrated into the levels is really well done with you solving puzzles and looking for, for stuff and exploration and all of that stuff. I really appreciate it, but this is also because I'm a big fan of back in the day of Soul Reaver, which also had a somewhat of a similar mechanic. It even has the, the similar thing. Well, if, if I remember correctly, it's been quite a few years since I played Soul Reaver, all right? And I'm an old man by now. But if I remember correctly, back in Soul Reaver, whenever you had uh, a location that had water, you could shift to whatever the other dimension was, and water wouldn't be there. It's the same thing in this game, right? Whenever there's water, you shift into Umbral, water's not there, gives you access to a whole new zone, which is kind of cool. I think that's a, a neat little, it feels almost like a nod to Soul Reaver in a lot of ways, which is something that I appreciated. So I love the level design and all that stuff. And I've also heard from people, oh, but you know, level design should consider more things like enemy placement and all that. Enemy placement didn't bother me too much. But there were a couple of levels where I will agree there were too many enemies. There were definitely a couple of levels where it's just like, bro, okay, let me explore the level a little bit before you throw like 50 more enemies at me. It almost feels like they're constantly spawning. And you're not even an umbral. Because an umbral, that is part of the mechanic. If you're an umbral, enemies are constantly respawning and constantly coming in. And more enemies and more enemies and more enemies. But when you're an axiom... It's supposed to be a little bit more chill. Enemies are not respawning. So you can clear a whole, a whole zone in Axiom and enemies will stop spawning, right? But they just have so many of them. But the thing that even bothers me more about some of those is that sometimes, let's say you're going through a zone, there'll be an enemy, they'll spawn behind you. But he doesn't spawn immediately. So like, even if you know that this enemy is here, you can't hit him, you can't see him, but you know he's there because he spawned in behind you last time you were through this zone. Then you advance the zone a little bit, and they'll spawn behind you. And it's like this. I'm not against having those types of situations in games. I think that's fine. You do it like a couple of times. In this game, in a lot of levels, they do it all the time. Like, I cannot, I cannot tell you how many times I died to, like, the lobiest of lobby enemies because it spawned behind me and I'm facing like a much bigger threat ahead of me. And then comes, you know, like Johnny Flayed, like all on fire with his face melting. He's like, bah! slaps me at the wrong time, interrupts my attack. And then the big boy's like, and kills you. So there are situations like that. So you got to be careful. Um, but like I said, it doesn't bother me too much with the exception of the last, the very last zone. I feel like in the last zone, the developers went out of their way to, to basically use every dirty trick in the book they could. Now, I think it's fine to use dirty tricks on players. I'm not talking about like, oh, killing you in an, in an unforgivable, in, a, in an unavoidable way. I'm talking about situations where, for instance, you know, you put an enemy that is like, baiting you to do something and then there's another enemy right there i th you know but you're gonna go for the enemy that's baiting you and then the other enemy shows up behind you he's more powerful he's he's got all these tricks up his sleeve and all of this stuff right and it feels a little bit dirty but i think it's, it's cool to have those situations every now and then the final zone of lords of the fallen they just took that ranked it up to 11 like every single situation that where they could potentially screw you over they're like yep we're gonna do it do them all everything from enemies spawning behind them to whenever you look into umbral there's a reaper right there waiting to pull you into umbral because the mechanic one of the mechanics with the lantern right 
is that you can peer into Umbral without actually going to Umbral. So you can kind of like do a little bit of exploration and figure out, do I want to go into Umbral here? Are there rewards that are worth it, right? But the interesting thing is whenever you look, and this is a really cool mechanic, by the way, whenever you're looking into Umbral, enemies can pull you into Umbral. So like if there's enemies there, they can pull you into Umbral. So they'll pull you from the world of the living into the this other world of darkness, which is a really cool mechanic. It's it's like, you know, you, you get you get surprised and you're like, oh god damn, they pulled me into Umbral. Holy crap. It's cool. The problem is that a lot of times in that last level, it's like every it feels like every time you pull out your lantern, there's a Reaper there waiting to pull you in. And at that point, it's no longer a surprise. It's expected. It's like, okay, I know what you're gonna do. There, there's another mechanic in this game wherein enemies will have parasites. And the parasites is basically something that will make an enemy invincible. In order to get rid of the parasite, you can either go into Umbral and kill the parasite, or you can siphon the parasite using your lantern. So you pull out the lantern, you press R1, and your character starts like siphoning the parasite until the parasite dies, and then you can kill the enemy normally. And in a lot of situations in that last level, it's like you see, oh, this enemy has a parasite. You pull out your lantern, you start siphoning the Reaper! In comes Reaper, pulls you in. It's, it's too much. I feel like they really did that stuff too much in the last level. Now, it doesn't, again, it's not something that stops me from playing the game or anything like that, but I do feel like it plays more on frustration than necessarily fun. Another thing is there's a, there's several, there's just basically several sections of the last level that feel unfair. Let's just put it like that. They do. Now that I know all of them, because I've been through that level like three times, it's not going to bother me as much. But for a new player, I can see them getting into that point and just being like, gee, this is some nonsense, dude. What are you doing? <laughs> okay. But you know, that's that particular mechanic. So anyways, the, um, the gameplay overall, besides some of these uh, criticisms that I have there, uh, is fantastic. I think that one of the really cool things they've done is dual wielding. Uh, whenever you can dual wield anything in this game. Uh, however, it does limit you to two move sets. So depending on the weight of the weapons that you are using, you either go into a light move set or a heavy move set. But it uses both weapons, which means let's say you have a weapon with bleed and another weapon with poison. You can inflict both of those status ailments by just dual wielding, uh, which is kind of cool. And it allows for a lot of build diversity when you're planning things out. You can have like these really status inflicting builds and you can plan things out to, for maybe a weapon that deals more stagger and another weapon that does something else. Whatever, right? That's kind of cool. So you can dual wield. There's also the traditional uh, sword and board gameplay. And here's the interesting thing that is going to surprise a lot of people if you haven't been watching my live stream. I've actually not been using shields almost at all in this game. And you're like, Rurikon, but I've seen your last live stream. You have a shield on your back. Yep, it's on my back. It's a stat stick. I just use my shield to have runes on there that give me certain effects. Like, I believe that in, my, in the playthrough that I have on the live stream, I had mana regeneration and life regeneration on my shield. And that is all it's there for. Because I don't ever use the shield in my hand. Even though it's a light shield, I could technically use it to parry. It makes parry a little bit easier. But mostly I'm just bonking stuff. And it's... It's just very interesting that this was the first time that I did not use a shield as much as I've used in other games. Even though in the gameplay that you're watching I am using a shield, you'll notice that I don't tend to use it to block that much. And the reasoning is, whenever you block... You actually always take damage. There's no 100% block shields in this game, or at least if there are, I haven't found them. But I, I don't think they exist at all. You, there's no shield blocks 100%. So they block a percentage of the damage, and whatever they, <clears throat> whenever you block with a shield, you take withered damage. Now, withered damage is basically like the regain health from Bloodborne. So you take damage, and it leaves you a little bit of, uh, like a grayed out bit of health in your bar. If you deal damage to an enemy back, you'll get that back. But if you take direct damage um, while your health is withered, you'll lose all of that health in one go. The cool thing is that the withered health doesn't go away until you get hit. So you can really plan around it. You can't afford to just like be with tons of withered health and then just hit an enemy a couple of times and boom, your health is full. So that's an interesting uh, dynamic. It's not like uh, Bloodborne where your health eventually goes back to normal after you've gotten hit. You can really plan things out and figure out 
when you want to strike back at an enemy, which actually makes blocking an interesting mechanic. There's also parrying, like I said. Um, the, the thing about parrying is that you still take a little bit of wither damage, but there's so many advantages to parrying because you'll bust up your enemy's stagger gauge, which then lets you do grievous strikes, which, you know, it's kind of the same thing that you've seen in other games where you break their posture and then you do a visceral attack. Whatever, you guys know what, what that stuff is. In case you're curious, like if you're playing the game and you still don't understand the posture system, I have a full-on guide that explains all of that stuff already in the channel. But uh, yeah, I like that system. I think it's an interesting system and it's been one of the first times where a game has a bunch of shields and I'm just like, oh, I'm, I'm actually not just going to use a shield. Even though the current character that I'm working on, I'm trying to maximize the potential of using a shield. And we'll see if that works out or not, but it's an interesting experiment uh, to go through. But yeah, that's been very very interesting um what else okay a very important thing throwables i love throwables in this game now throwables is something that i don't tend to use in most souls likes because i souls likes and even souls games because i just find them a hassle it's like oh now i have to go here and i have to buy this stuff again and i have to buy this thing here and this merchant sells this throwable that i like and this other merchant all the way over there sells this other throwable and it's like it's such a hassle that I'm like, I just don't want to use them. It's too much of a hassle. In this game, throwables are an actual weapon. So like, let's say you find, ah, you found the uh, holy grenade. There's actually holy grenades in the game. You have the holy grenade. And the way that it works is you have an ammunition gauge and this ammunition fills up whenever you rest. And then there's one consumable that lets you, actually there's two consumables that give varying amounts of ammunition that lets you just refill your ammunition. That's it. That's all the... I mean, there, there's more mechanics around it, like eventually you can get some eyeballs for your lantern that also lets you use wither damage as throwable ammunition. Gets a little bit more complex, lets you really do some really crazy fun builds, which again, big ups for that. But like, I cannot emphasize how much more fun it's been to use throwables in this game because you just know, oh, I ran out of throwables, go to the thing, rest, all my throwables are back. Cool. That to me is amazing. It doesn't feel like... A hassle doesn't feel like a chore great it's the same thing with uh, bow and arrow so i could say oh i found cinder arrows that's an ammunition type so you load it up in your bow you have cinder arrows forever whenever you run out of them go rest or use a consumable and you get more of them i'm assuming that you can i mean you can because you can buy the um, you can just straight up buy this ammunition consumable so if you just want to do a full-on ranged playthrough you can do that I don't know how easy or how hard it will be. I actually think that a full range playthrough is probably going to be super easy. I was actually thinking about what would be the most powerful character type. And I think it's probably going to be some type of agility character that has a lot of ranged stuff. Because you can kill enemies before they even see you. Which, you know, massive advantage. That's something that they let you do. Uh, so that is really cool. Uh, the ammunition system, the throwables, that... Is a complete and, and here's the interesting thing with throwables too because the way that you equip them there's like these three slots to equip it is your uh, right hand left hand and then your ranged hand so to speak and in the ranged hand you can equip your throwing hand which would be for throwables and you can equip up the three throwables and then you can swap between them to use all three of them so like for instance you could use the throwing hammers that i was using near the end of the game which were brutal they destroyed everything you can use that combined with poison javelins so like let's say oh i want to inflict poison on that enemy pull out the poison javelins boom he's got poison and you're like and now i want to deal a little bit of damage swap to the hammers boom you, now you're dealing damage or oh now i also want to set the enemies on fire okay swap out the fire grenades throw those boom you can do all of this at the touch of a button you don't have to like press up and down on d-pad and all that stuff you just press l2 to aim and then you press like, I think there's three buttons, three of your faceplate buttons will change between the different ammunition types. And then you press R2 to fire it. Or you can lock on and press R1 and it will never miss because you can also re-aim and do all that. It's just, I cannot emphasize enough. I loved the way that they've done throwables. I love the way that they've done uh, ranged ammunition in general. I think it's really, really cool. And then the other thing is spell casting. They've also done some really cool stuff with spell casting. In the fact that you basically can equip already, like, let's say, your best catalysts are going to have five spells. Then, depending on the catalyst that you're using, it might be limited by three spells. Or, there's also um, additional rings and amulets that'll give you additional spell slots, up to five. But the maximum that you can have is five spells. 
But the thing is, you don't have to be pressing up and down on D-pad to select which spell you want to cast. You press a button. You press L2, and then you press a button, and you're casting that spell. And you can have four spells available at any given time. Super cool. I mean, there's a reason why this is actually, again, it was one of the first games where I didn't just rely on my traditional, you know, uh, sword and shield type of playthrough. Not just sword, and usually I'll go axes, hammers, whatever. You guys get the idea. But, you know, my usual... Uh, sword and board type of um, type of play style that I go for. And I went for more of a beefy two-hander, smack everything into oblivion. <clears throat> but not only that, I went to doing, like, caster characters, which I rarely do, because I think caster characters are just, like, annoying and fidgety as crap, because, oh, press up on D-pad a bunch of times, select your spell, then cast it, then press up on D-pad. They've done spell casting in a way that feels way cooler. So that is something that I think is also super cool. Now, uh, all of this, naturally, the dual wielding, spell casting, throwables, ranged stuff, two-handing, uh, even sword and board, all of that gives you like a, a ridiculous range of builds that you can make. And again, you have multiplayer, you have co-op, you have PvP. Multiplayer is not perfect. Like I said, I have a full video on it if you're curious, but it is... Also an improvement with some of the features that they've added to multiplayer where you don't just get kicked out after you've finished killing a boss. You can continue playing with your friends. Uh, you can be summoned into any area, even if that area does not have a boss present. Like if you guys want to do some farming or if you want to show something to a friend or if a friend wants to show something to you. There's like... The, the multiplayer actually has a lot of good things. Even though it's not perfect, it's got a lot of shortcomings as well. But they've done a fantastic job there. So with the build diversity, all of this stuff, all these cool combat mechanics, it just feels like a really fun fun game to play. Personally, to me, I'm having a blast. Despite all of the technical issues, all of the performance issues that we went over here that I think is important to bring up because there's definitely a lot of problems here. There's definitely a lot of stuff that the team needs to do to get the game in, you know, in proper order. As a matter of fact, if people are asking me, should I pick this up right now? My advice would be wait for a bit, wait for a couple of more patches. Let's see if things stable out. Let's see what the developers are working on. All of that stuff. But it's still... I, I've just been still having a blast. Now, there's just a couple of more things that I want to bring up, which are my final points here. And that is, some of the bosses don't get affected by status ailments. Which, you know, I guess that's fair. Um, but it's also weird because if you're making a build and you're relying on status ailments because the game has these really cool status ailments that you can play around with... Like, uh, for instance, you can have a build where whenever you poison somebody, they'll also get a bleed. Or, in my case, I was playing an Infernal, and I have this status called Ignite, which causes these explosions whenever I hit enemies. And it, it's almost like Blast in Monster Hunter. But the thing is, my Ignite also caused monsters to catch fire, and it also causes them to be more vulnerable to fire damage and all of these things. And when you have bosses that straight up just like, oh, I just don't take status ailments. You're like, well... That kind of throws a wrench in my build. It's not a huge problem because of my next thing that I'm going to say, but it is definitely something that I think it would be interesting for this team to see how they could balance bosses around also being affected by status ailments. Now, the reason, like I'm saying, that this is not a big problem is because overall bosses are too easy. I was thinking to myself that potentially this is, oh, my build has come online and now I'm just ridiculously overpowered, which is what happened, like, if you guys go and you watch the, the live stream of all of my gameplay, I would say that, like, once we reach the 60% mark, which is when my build fully came online, which is just, like, this big hammer bonk build, don't give a damn about nothing, I basically just ignored every single mechanic and every single boss from that point forward. I'm, I'm not exaggerating. Like, people might think, oh, he's exaggerating. Go watch the footage. It's ridiculous. Like, I... I could basically sit in front of a boss, start charging my weapon, and the boss goes like, My biggest attack is coming! And then smack me in the face with the attack, and I'm sitting there charging my weapon, and it's like, okay, my turn. And I'll smack the boss, get all of my health back, and at the same time, just inflict like one-fourth of his life bar, gone. I'm not exaggerating, I'm really not. People will think I am, I'm not. This happened to me in the final boss of the game. Straight up, it's like, shh, boom, dead. I had more problem with mobs leading up to the bosses than necessarily the bosses themselves. So I feel like they potentially need to rebalance the bosses. Maybe the bosses are balanced this way because in New Game Plus, they get way too strong. 
and then you need to figure that stuff out. But boss has definitely felt too easy. But it's interesting because it's a bit of a double-edged sword. Because if you go to my first live stream, you'll see me wipe, like, I don't know, probably 20 times to the very first boss, Pieta. Just wipe to her, like, 20 times, maybe more. And then you'll see me wipe again at the Congregator of Flesh, like, 20 more times. Something like that. Because I just didn't know how to play the game yet at that point. I was still, like, figuring stuff out. Once I figured stuff out, once my build came online, that I can pretty much kill anything in the game right now. Not really too big of a problem. Like, maybe I'll wipe a couple of times, but not for long. Because the bosses straight up are not hard, and there's, there's just mechanics in the game that allow you to brutalize bosses. So if you're looking for that type of power fantasy, maybe this is actually a plus. You can straight up, once you figure out the game's mechanics, you can straight up brutalize bosses. Like, you'll see, if you see the short where I... What did I call that one? The power of bonk? I forget. I, I just call it bonk or something. It's just me with a hammer just like beating down this boss. It's disgusting. And that boss was level appropriate. I've come to find a little bit later. It was, it was, I thought that I was overpowered for that boss now that I know the order in which things play out in the game. I wasn't. I wasn't overpowered for that boss. And I just beat her down like she was nothing. So yeah, they need to figure out their bosses a little bit more. But overall, it's still... Uh, it's still been a fantastic experience. Even through the technical issues, the crashes, and all of that stuff, I still had an absolute blast exploring the world and all of that stuff. The, the biggest problem with this game is that it needed to be in the oven a little bit longer, 100%. It, it just, I think it needed like six more months, and we would have gotten a really, pol a really good polished gem. But for some reason, they decided to release it early, and it is what it is. I'm still rooting for the team. I hope that they get everything together, but we'll see how that pans out. Hopefully, this review helped you make a decision as to whether or not this is a game that you're interested in. I'm very curious to hear from you guys in the comment section down below. I'll see you guys in the next one. Stay strong. Stay safe. Peace out.